good to see you guys coming again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, looking forward to Pastor's message this morning. It's about criticism. But I want to take a moment to say thank all the, all the people who helped out while I was going. Yeah, a lot of feelings, too many to talk about. Uh, you know, Bill Bentley had to put up with Ray Kaufman a couple of times. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> Did that sound pretty cool? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to listen to the message today, Pastor. Not fun. Talking about criticism. Standing, if you would, our opening song, He is Exalted. <laughs>
Yeah, because everybody criticizes everyone. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I personally, I, I don't get on the Facebook. I, I think the company has a, a Facebook section where the, the office manager takes care of that. Yeah. So on, if you see it's on the Snoop, she has a Facebook page. It's on the Snoop. <laughs> Facebook be pretty critical sometimes. Yeah. Amen. You ever read some of the stuff on that? Your mom once in a while tells you something. You know what so-and-so said? Yeah. I, I, I'm looking forward to a, a message someday, Pastor, on on um, uh, Facebook headaches. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really think someone needs a good sermon on Facebook uh, issues. Social media. The whole thing to be a social media message. Get all these negative remarks back. <laughs> but I found Facebook to be a, a place where you can really criticize if you want to. You're not looking at anybody in the face, right? Yep. You say things you wouldn't say to the face, right? Yep. You're a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I stay away from it. But instead of criticizing and putting people down, try lifting them up and showing them love.
ladies in prayer this morning. Uh, I'm ready to do that. Just wanted you to look here. We've cut the lights back some on this, just for so the people online, you who are out there, can see what it actually looks like. Because uh, we can see your natural eye is so much better than a camera. Because the camera shows a big blob of light, is all it shows. You can't see it as a cross. And so we thought we'd cut the lights just to let the people for one Sunday see that there actually is a cross here. Um, and so then we'll have all the lights back on uh, next week. Uh, so that's, we didn't forget. We just wanted others to be able to see. Uh, any, any praise reports, prayer requests you have this morning? This is the, the nephew that got the heart transplant. The heart part's doing well, but he's not able to eat for some reason and has gotten real weak. So pray for him that he'll be able to eat and, and get strength back. Any other? The Jim Stiver family, mm -hmm. I requested prayer for him last week. He was in a bad car accident, or motorcycle accident. He passed away. Yeah, I've seen that. So remember this family would have lost the dad with the motorcycle accident. Um, and also... Penn's Manor lost a student this week uh, to cancer. Uh, Sinclair. Adam Sinclair. Adam Sinclair. Uh, he was what, a sophomore, Silas? Junior? So, freshman. Freshman, freshman. Okay, sorry. But he was a freshman. So remember this family. Remember the students too. Was, it affects all of them. Uh, people aren't supposed to die when they're in high school. Uh, anything? Yeah. Darlene's sister, yeah, yeah, Betty Seth. Uh, remember her. My dad has a PET scan tomorrow. Okay. And we have a friend of ours who messaged us this morning. His 15 year old stepdaughter had brain surgery at 5 o'clock this morning. The only thing he told us in the message was she yesterday she was fine and then her feet went numb. They took her to Indiana and then they life flighted her to Children's and we got that message. Remember Izzy had the brain surgery this morning. Remember the test tomorrow. Uh, I have a phrase. I narrowly avoided an accident on my way home last night, but I avoided it. That's the important thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd like the 73 people in cars on 581. Had a 73 car power. I thought it has to be on 80, but it wasn't going to change. Any unspoken requests you have? Somebody else? Yes, Pearl? Yeah, I'd like you to remember Chris Twig. Okay. Um, yeah, he uh, he finally got the okay and they got the knife and that and they were going to do surgery on him. He has brain cancer too. Okay. And he's from, he went, he went to Penn, Penn's Man. I fed him at school too. Okay. And Chris Twig is having brain surgery uh, as well. <laughs> the unspoken, uh, the Lord hears those and as well. He knows all about that. So, Ron, you'll come and give us our prayer for us. If you would, and speak into our hearts for prayer. And as always, our altars are open. If you want to bring a special need, special concerns on your heart this morning, feel free to join us at the altar this morning. We're standing on holy ground.
Ukraine and what they're going through and uh, Jews who are there, the believers who are there. Uh, the altar is open to come and pray. Pray for those who are at the altar or come join them. Uh, we also said that if you want to give to Ukraine, you can mark one of the little envelopes for Ukraine this morning. Uh, and we need to meet with the uh, missions committee after church real quick to be thinking about what you want us to give to Ukraine and their ministry through the Wesleyan Church. Father God, we thank you. We thank you. We have one to turn to. We praise you for that. That song this morning, that scripture said, when you pass through the waters, that you'll be with us. One of the most difficult things in our life is, is thrown about and tossed to and fro, Lord. You'll be with us. Hallelujah. You'll be with us. We praise you that you're the God who's Emmanuel. And you said, when you go through the waters, they'll not over, overtake you, you'll not drown. We praise you, Lord, that Amen. though we can't see a way out, when we feel like we're totally empty and we have nothing else to give, we thank you, Lord that you will help us get through those times. We thank you for the promise of your word in Isaiah 43. Lord, we pray for these ones who have asked for prayer, Lord, this morning, those who need your special touch for Butch's nephew, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would cause his appetite to return, cause him to be able to eat again, Lord. Give strength to his body from that, we pray, and help this young one that Jess mentioned who had to have brain surgery, Lord, that you would touch them, bring healing from that, we pray, in a special way. Father, we pray for your blessing upon the Father, Lord, going for tests tomorrow, that you would give your health and your healing. Whatever is going in for Father, we pray that you would show healing to it, Lord. Take it away like only you can do. Bring your healing, we pray, oh God. We pray for Chris Twig, Lord, who's having one have surgery as well, that you would help this one, Lord, and the Putt family, Lord, who's lost a loved one, and, and this young man, Lord, and, and the students at Penn's Manor, Lord, who gone through this loss of somebody that's, that's in their class, somebody their age actually died and it doesn't seem right, it doesn't seem real and, and it scares them, gives them anxiety and everything else that goes with that. Father, please hear these requests, especially those unspoken requests that we can't voice publicly but you know all about them and you care about them and only you can do something about them. Father, hear these requests, Lord, we pray and each spoken and each unspoken request, Lord Jesus. Draw near, we pray. Help those ones that need your special grace this morning. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for listening, Father. Thank you for caring to carry our burdens, Lord. You said come boldly and, and cast your burdens upon you. And so we do that this morning. Help those in Ukraine, especially help those who are believers and those who are Jewish people, Lord, that need your touch. Give your help, Lord, we pray in this time. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus, Jesus be exalted, be glorified in the situation. Be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 out there about God intervening in amazing ways in the midst of this Ukrainian-Russian conflict, this brutal invasion by Russia into Ukraine. Um, we're obviously seeing lots of headlines about that battle, but amid those headlines, there have been these amazing stories, these claims of God intervening. What can you tell us about that? 
Well, I, I've got to tell you, Billy, we, I, I haven't been able to verify this, but I think it's amazing. There are a lot of Christians in Ukraine talking about this, but uh, last week I talked to our CBN Ukraine director, and I said, look, tell me, are there any miracles going on? He said, yes, as a matter of fact, there are. There was a member of our church whose son went to the front lines, and he and his battle group were facing the Russians, and he called his dad on a cell phone. They still have cell phone service, and he said, Dad... Uh, you've got to get people in the church praying because I don't know if we're going to make it through this. The, we're, we are fighting overwhelming odds here. The, the Russians are just so large and they have all this mechanical equipment, tanks and uh, armored personnel carriers and anti-aircraft stuff, every, you name it, artillery. Uh, and he said, I don't know if we're going to make it. So the father got off the phone. He called members of his church and they started a prayer chain and they started praying nonstop. Uh, for their men in the field and for this man's son. And the son called back later in the evening. He said, Dad, you, you wouldn't believe it. it. It was like a UFO or something. We've never seen anything like it. Just a brilliant flash of lightning in the sky, just taking over the whole sky. We haven't seen that. We thought maybe the Americans or somebody had a, a weapon they were using, but we haven't seen this. And then the next morning they woke up and they said all the uh, equipment from the Russians was destroyed. Wow. I mean, that's a... That's an amazing miracle, Billy, and, and I've got to say, it, it kind of reminded me a bit of the Bible. I think it's in Judges 7, uh, Gideon and Gideon's army. Remember, the Lord had him whittle down the army to about 300 men. They were facing 135,000 Midianites, and Gideon said, how are we ever going to beat you know, these guys? Kind of like the Ukrainians with yeah. the Russians. Yeah. And uh, God intervened. They went to the camp of the enemy of the Midianites, and the Midianites became confused and started, started fighting one another. And that leads me to th this other story that he talked about, and that was there was a battalion of uh, tanks coming through a Ukrainian village, and they uh, took over the village, and afterwards they, grabbed, they saw Ukrainian flags at City Hall and around the village, and they took these flags and they planted them on their tanks. The spoils of war. We defeated the Ukrainians. This is a souvenir we can take home. And later that evening, they were on, on the way to meet up with another battle tank group. And uh, when they did, that group thought they were Ukrainians. So they opened fire on them. So very much like Gideon's army, fighting one another. Well, I know. Well, I was going to say, in, the, in that story, I know there were some prayers going out, you know, for the Russians to sort of fight one another, to, to turn on one another in some way. So it was interesting to hear that story. And as believers, right, as we look at all of this, whether we can verify the different reports or not, you know, as Christians taking a step back, when we read scripture and we see what is possible with God, when we look at a, a situation going on in real time, we should believe that any of these things are possible, right? Well, we should, and I think it's encouraging to Christians, even if it's been embellished a little bit, it encourages us in our faith. But, but I, I've got to say, Billy, as a believer, uh, I also uh, feel bad for Russians. I mean, I, I can't imagine uh, Russians turning their tanks on one another and just slaughtering one another. I mean, it, it's bad enough fighting an enemy. But to do that to one another, and I, I feel for the family member. I've been to Russia a number of times. I feel for the family members, uh, the parents. Yeah, I know it's a little cut off there quickly. Uh, but remember the Russian soldiers as well, because a lot of times they're there because they have to. And some of them don't, so they don't know why they're fighting. They've been lied to. Um, and so from the top they know, but some of the soldiers don't know. Facing critics, um, this is like law and order. Um, the person on the screen is not supposed to resemble anybody you know. Uh, if, if you don't, if, if it is, it, it, it's not meant to. And, and uh, uh, anyway, that's what they always say. In Acts chapter eleven, um, Peter had the most glorious miracle experience, and, and Peter is probably smarter than me, but I always thought when great things like that happen, I mean, everybody's happy and everybody's glad, and nobody criticizes. But even Peter here is going to be criticized. Um, so we turn to 
Acts chapter 11, remember the Holy Spirit came on uh, after Peter began speaking on Cornelius and his household, the Gentiles. And it says, soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that Gentiles had received the word of God. But, but, when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered a home of the Gentiles, and you even ate with them. How, I, I guess, I guess gossip traveled well back then too. <laughs> Uh, not just today. Even without Facebook, they got the message that they could criticize. Uh, and Peter told them exactly what happened. I was in the town of Joppa, he said. And while I was praying, I went into a trance and I saw a vision. Something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners from the sky. And it came right down to me and I looked inside the sheet and I saw all sorts of tame and wild animals, reptiles and birds. And I heard a voice say, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, I replied. I have never eaten anything our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. But the voice from heaven spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. This happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up to heaven. Just then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were staying, and the Holy Spirit told me to go with them, and do not worry that they were Gentiles. These six brothers, or Jewish, have here accompanied me, and soon we entered the home of the man who sent for us. He told us how an angel appeared to him in his home, and had told him, send messengers to Joppa, and summoning a man named Simon Peter. He will tell you and everyone in your household, how you can be saved. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he fell on us at the beginning. And I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? And this is the last point of the message. God can turn criticism into praise. When others heard this, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting for their sins and receiving eternal life. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, help us to be changed from our prejudice, from our bad thinking, from our pride. Let your Holy Spirit cleanse us and make us to love like you want us to. Give us your courage, your wisdom. Give us your anointing this morning to show your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes you get criticism that is, uh, and criticism is just being judging or uh, unfavorably fault finding. Uh, some people write notes anonymously, and uh, they want to be negative, but they don't want you to know who it's coming from. Uh, and you see these strange things on Facebook like, somebody did me wrong, and you know who you are out there. <laughs> okay. Uh, and all their friends saying, was it me? Was it me? Kind of like all of Jesus' disciples to Jesus. Am I going to betray you? Am I the one? Um, but those ones who don't sign their complaint are, should often be overlooked. I heard of a pastor who got this anonymous letter, and all it said was, fool. And so the next Sunday morning, he got up, and he said, I've gotten a lot of letters who say something negative, and they don't write their name. He said, this is the first time I've ever got somebody to write a letter and not not write the note, just write their name. <laughs> Sometimes it backfires. But the, the point I want to make above all else is if you obey God, you will be criticized. And it doesn't make sense to me because I always thought it was if you obey God, you won't be criticized. Everyone will love you. Everyone will, will think you're great and it'll be 
But everyone's criticized at some time, and nobody likes it. Do you like being criticized? Anybody? I don't think we do. But Moses was criticized by his brother and sister and by Israel about 100,000 times. Paul was criticized by the Corinthians. Peter was criticized by Paul and criticized here. David was criticized by his wife. Job was also. Daniel was criticized for praying. The three Hebrew children were criticized for not bowing. Jesus, the perfect one, was criticized for healing on the Sabbath day. Because that was a huge crime. And so people sometimes just like to criticize. I, in a Peanuts uh, cartoon, Linus is curled up in a chair reading his book and Lucy stands behind him with a funny look on her face. And Lucy then says, it's very strange. It happens just by looking at you. And Linus stops and says, what happens? She says, I can feel a criticism coming on. <laughs> I think some of those people may have got into the church as well. But none of us like to be criticized. We usually want to find fault with the other person. And this was not supposed to end my message. God just reminded me of it on the way over here. One of my worst times, I think, of not responding well to criticism. We were starting our softball team practice probably around 2005, 2004. And uh, I remember I was, there was, one of the boys behind me was uh, catching and they were pitching and we were just hitting batting practice and I must not have been hitting very well. I can't remember, but I'm sure it's what it was. And so this young man behind me, who's a senior, uh, who, to be honest, couldn't hit worth a lick. And he tells me what I need to do to hit better. I didn't take it well. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I responded, I've been hitting softballs before you were born. That's true, but it wasn't kind. Um, and, and I've always felt bad at saying that. And that was not a good response to somebody criticizing. Uh, and unfortunately, um, that's what I did. Sometimes we like to blame others. Somebody else's fault. I read of a guy who was driving his car in Milwaukee. Uh, maybe he had some old Milwaukee with him. But uh, he said his car behind him kept riding too close. And then when he went to stop, it would stop. And when he would take off, it would take off. Always driving the same speed. So he's pulled over by a cop and he said, hey, this guy behind me is just, just tailgating me all the time. So the cop looked and he said, hey, you hooked this guy. It was a parked car. And that's why he's with you all the time. <laughs> it's somebody else's fault. This guy's doing it wrong. And so we can find fault with the critic, which I did, or blame others, or just return the criticism. George Burns says, Too bad the only people that know how to run this country are busy driving cabs and cutting hair. <laughs> and that might go, go a little ways today as well. Sometimes we just want to uh, ignore or appease. Uh, one man said as a worship leader, he was at a worship conference and he said there's all kinds of uh, creative people there and lots of skinny jeans. And uh, this was this was what I thought too, but I didn't think everybody else would say it. And he said, lots of worship leaders wear skinny jeans. And uh, he said they also wear something else. He said it's a it's a target on their back. Not intending, because if you're going to get up in front of people and lead in worship, you're not going to please everyone. Not everyone's going to encourage you. You're going to be scrutinized and criticized. He said, I've heard criticism for my song selection, my musical style, my tempo, my volume, my lighting, even my clothing. Um, there's always something to criticize. But with Peter here, when he is criticized, they begin to criticize him for eating with the wrong people. He responded, he listened to it, and responded respectfully. He says, oh, and he did the same thing in Acts 2. Remember in Acts 2 when they were filled with the Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues and, and they understood them and they began to mock and said, these people are just drunk. That's why they're acting like this. They're drunk. They had too much to drink. And Peter stands up and said, men of Israel, 
These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. So you know they can't be drunk. He said, this is what Job spoke about. And so he listened to what they said, even responded to it, but didn't respond like I did. Responded in a good way. And it wasn't America, so he could say, it's only 9 o'clock, you can't be drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. In America, you can be. But Proverbs 15.31 says, uh, to listen to correction, to improve your life, and you will live among the wise. Proverbs says again and again, if you, the wise listen to correction, and, and it comes veiled as criticism at times, but will you listen? Will you hear it? And improve your life. George Washington Gothels was the man responsible for completing the Panama Canal. It's one of the most important in the world. I read just this week 14,000 uh, boats a year cross through that. But the big problem he had in, in completing it was the climate was bad, the geography was bad, but his biggest challenge was with critics back in the United States who said he'll never finish it. He'll never finish it. And, and one of his colleagues says, aren't you going to answer those critics? He said, in time. They said, when? He said, when the Panama Canal is finished. That's what I'll answer. Because they're saying, I won't finish it. And so, don't spend all your time responding to criticism. That's what he was trying to tell us. Don't spend all your time responding to it. And, and we often use the phrase in a negative way. We just say, well, consider the source. And that usually means, um, don't pay attention to them. But think a little better on that. We, we should consider the source of the criticism. Peter did in Acts chapter 4 when he was arrested and demanded about the man who was paralyzed to walk. They said, by what power or what name did this man get healed? And Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said, rulers and leaders of our people, it was by the name of Jesus was the one who did this. And, but he knew that they wouldn't believe. And so, and they didn't believe in Jesus, but he said, Jesus is the one that you crucified. But he rose from the dead. And now, there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. He spoke the truth, but as Ephesians says, he's spoken in love. He spoke the truth. He didn't just say whatever they wanted to hear. But he did consider the source. It's unhealthy to believe everything you hear or every criticism you listen to. But sometimes we have to consider the source and see where they're coming from. But think about this. Remember Balaam? The source was a donkey. But God was still speaking to the donkey. So you can consider the source, but in spite of the source, God still may be trying to get our attention about something. He still may be trying to help us to hear something he once heard. And so consider the source, but don't just bypass it completely. One pastor, uh, Dr. Lyman Beecher, was asked why he didn't reply to some anonymous letters criticizing him. And he said, I learned a long time ago. He said, I was walking through the, through the field, and I saw, I had a handful of books, and I saw a little animal, so I decided to pitch these books at the animal and hit him. But I got sprayed with the awful, nastiest stuff I've ever smelled in my <laughs> life, and I've learned never to do that again. So when I come to people who I want to toss something back at, I just remember the skunk, and I decide not to do that. Because it doesn't get me any farther when I'm criticizing back or trying to hurt those who are, are coming against me. Because Peter spoke the truth, he spoke in love, considering the people. Um, but he wasn't controlled by the criticism. He didn't give up because of the criticism. They said, Peter, why did you go in that house? And you spoke to, to these people. And he said, well, let, me, let me explain what happened. So he wasn't controlled by it. And in other places, when he was criticized by the rulers, when he was arrested, and they commanded him to never speak in the name of Jesus again. He responded with a question. He said this. They were Jewish leaders. 
Do you think God would want us to obey you rather than him? I can imagine it's about that side. Because the question has no answer. And Peter says we can't stop talking about or telling others about what we have seen and what we have heard. Don't be controlled by criticism when you think God wants you to do something different. Do what God tells us to do instead. The other thing in Acts chapter 4, what I did, I went through the book of Acts, the early part, at the times they were criticized and see how did they respond to the criticism. In Acts chapter 4, when they were criticized, they were threatened because they spoke in Jesus' name and, and they tried to get them to stop and they couldn't and they just threatened them some more so we can't do anything much to them. They threatened him further and released them. They took the criticism to God in prayer. That's what, that's what it says. It said, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priest and elders had said. And when they heard the report, all the believers lifted up their hands and their voices together to God in prayer. And they said, Lord, behold their threatenings and give us boldness to go ahead and speak anyway. Behold their criticisms, but Lord, let us go ahead and speak anyway. Keep speaking. Dr. Mitchell, a pastor, when someone in the congregation pointed out his several faults to him about his preaching and his life, instead of retaliating or trying to defend himself, he looked at the woman and said, If what you say is true, could I ask you to pray for me? Would you mind praying for me? Examine the element of truth that may be in the criticism. In Acts chapter 6, it says, As the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. Greek-speaking believers complained, criticized that the Hebrew-speaking believers, that their widows were not being given the right amount of food. They were being discriminated against in the daily food. And so the criticism was now in the church. It's not from the outside, it's from the inside. And the disciples were criticized because some of the widows are getting more food than the others are. And so they examine it. Is there any truth to this? Is there anything in this criticism that's true? And they must have felt there was. So they gathered together the believers and said, we have to spend our time preaching and praying. and We can't run this food program. So select seven people among you, full of the Holy Spirit that will run this for them. And it said that everyone liked this idea and they chose the following seven men. So Peter and the disciples heard the criticism. They thought there's some element of truth in this. Uh, we don't know if it's altogether true or not, but to, there's something true here and so let's fix it. And they put seven men in charge of that. But they had to humble themselves unlike me. When you're proud in your response it doesn't go real well but Peter and them didn't say hey we're the apostles we'll decide what to do we don't care what you think but they didn't they humbled themselves they didn't turn the criticism into a crisis criticism can hurt but pride will destroy us George Whitfield the famous English evangelists in the 1700s. We often think about those men and we read about the great exploits they had and hundreds came to Christ under his ministry and God blessed him fabulously. You think, man, if all that great stuff's happening, nobody would ever criticize him. Wrong. Wrong. It doesn't seem to matter. If you obey God, you'll be criticized. He says, after all the good that he did, he was not by his critics. He often received letters of criticism, mockery, or even hateful correction. Sometimes he'll be discouraged by the letters. But he soon learned it's just better to be open and honest on these personal attacks. And so he wrote a simple letter reply saying, Thank you heartily for your letter and for what you and my other enemies are saying about me. I know worse things about myself than you do, than you'll ever say about me. Love in Christ, George Whitfield. I know worse things about myself than you could ever say about me. We do. But Stephen forgave his critics. Remember Stephen, one of the seven they, they chose, and the Jewish leaders were infuriated 
about him in Acts chapter 7. They shook their fist at him in rage. That's pretty critical. They dragged him outside of town. They put their hands over their ears, shouting, and they rushed at him. They dragged him to the edge of the city and began to stone him to death. And what did Peter say? Or what did Stephen say? Lord, don't lay this charge to them. Don't lay this sin at their feet. Forgive them. He forgave his critics. And his critics weren't just launching words at him. They were launching stones. They were putting him to death. And yet he chose to forgive his critics. He said, Lord, don't lay the sin to their charge. Forgive them. The good thing is, is that God can turn it all around, as I showed you earlier. In the very first two verses, it says that Peter was criticized for what he did. But then he explained, and at the end it says, and they all praise God. They stopped objecting and began praising God. Criticism will make you either bitter or better. It's totally up to you. I know we have teachers in here, and I know as teachers you never get criticized by students or parents, right? <laughs> Anytime you do it, like what Rodney had said on here, if you don't want to be criticized, don't do anything, don't go anywhere. But what we have to do is come to Jesus for the Holy Spirit who can help us respond to the critic with love instead of being crushed by them and give us the grace to respond to those people as well. Sometimes they're very hurtful. I want to close with this story of David Simmons, who was a former cornerback for the Dallas Cowboys. And he talks about the criticism in his own childhood home. In a men's seminar, he said his father was a military man who was demanding, rarely said a kind word to him, always pushing him forward with harsh criticism to do better. Anytime he had done anything, his dad would always say, well, you could do better than that. You could do better. He wouldn't allow his son to feel any satisfaction. He always reminded him there's new goals ahead. When he was a little boy, his father bought him a bicycle that had to be put together and just gave it to him and said, put it together. He tried and tried and couldn't figure out how to put it together until he was in tears. And then his dad said, I knew he couldn't do it. And then he took the bike and put it together for him himself. He played high school football. His father was unrelenting in his criticism. He said, in the backyard after every game, we went through every play, and he told me what I did wrong. He said, most people have butterflies going into a game. I have butterflies going home from a game. I, were, I was more afraid of my father's criticism than the opposite team. By the time he entered college, he hated his father and his harsh discipline. He said, I chose to pray, play for the University of Georgia because it was the farthest away from my father I could get that was offering me a scholarship. After college, he became a second-round draft choice for, at that time, the St. Louis Cardinals football team. Joe Namath, who later signed with the New York Jets, was their first choice. He's excited. He calls his father. And his father, he said, well, I got drafted by the NFL. And he said, how does it feel to be drafted second? He said during college, however, he found Christ and he began to build a bridge back to his dad. Christ began to take away the hatred. And he said during visits at home, he started talking to him with interest about what his father had to say. And he learned what his grandfather was like. A tough lumberjack known for his quick temper. He once, picked, he once destroyed a pickup truck with a sledgehammer because it wouldn't start. He often beat his son. He said, knowing my father's upbringing made me more sympathetic to him. It helped me to see under the circumstances he might have done worse. And he said, with Christ's help, by the time he died, Dad and I had actually become friends. You see, critics drive us away from them often, but if we'll bring it to Jesus, he can supernaturally help us to love those who criticize us and 
who hurt us or wound us. He can help us to overlook those. He can help us to forgive those so we don't have to carry them, the wounds, all of our life. As David Simmons found out, it's Jesus who can help us forgive the critic. Get past the critic. Don't be buried by the things that they say. Realize that only God knows your true value. No critic knows it. Richard Dobbins often said to pastors, he said, you're never as good as your biggest fan, and you're never as bad as your worst critic. You're somewhere in between. So don't let the critics stop you from doing what you ought to do. Peter didn't. He had a great day and got, got back to headquarters and got criticized. But he didn't respond negatively. And he found the criticism being turned to praise. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, you know every critical word that the people sitting here have heard this week and throughout their life. Father, oftentimes we believe those things which are lies. Help them now in the power of Jesus to reject those. But help them to forgive those people who are also broken, who gave those words over them. And help us, Lord, to, to somehow, for the power of Jesus, overcome the criticism, love the critic. Lord, we can't do it by ourselves. It's not in our power. We can't try harder. Holy Spirit, come and let your love be shed abroad in our hearts, even for the critic. In Jesus' name.